I'm Scott Allen Miller, and I've been living in Nicaragua for three years continuously. I've been in and out for nine. And regular viewer Martin Bowen asked about his Starlink service. He has Starlink in the United States, and he's wondering if he can bring that with him when he's moving to or spending time in Nicaragua. Starlink is notoriously portable, and so that can be a really strong point that if you own it in one place, you can take it to another and potentially use the same service everywhere without having to switch anything up and deal with another provider or anything like that. So we're going to talk about the status of Starlink the quality and the performance and the functionality of Starlink and whether this makes sense for you when you're looking at moving abroad, especially to someplace like Nicaragua. We have some seriously bright sun this morning, so I got to move around a little bit to accommodate this. So Starlink is a satellite internet service. Most people are going to be pretty familiar with it, especially if you're watching this video. Starlink is interesting for this region because we have concerns about internet quality and speeds, and it would be nice to have access to American internet while living abroad. So Starlink potentially fills these gaps, and that made us here because I work online both as a content creator, as you know, because you're watching my show, but also as a digital nomad, I do a full work from home job where I have a lot of technical needs. So Starlink is very much on our radar from the very beginning. When we first knew that we were moving to Nicaragua full time in mid to late 2020, we started looking into Starlink because I had lived in Nicaragua in 2015. And at that time, uh, the internet here was okay, but it wasn't fantastic. We definitely had drops. We definitely had slowness issues. And we were concerned about uh, being able to work here because uh, my entire family works online. And of course, I have kids and, and they, you know, being uh, Gen Z and younger Gen Alpha as well, uh, they, you know, being online is very important for them. So we really were looking into what it would take to make sure that we'd be online all the time. So at the time, Starlink was up and coming. It seemed like it was going to be a really good choice. So we looked and at that time, Starlink was slated uh, to come into Nicaragua. Of course, they give you aggressive estimates, but late 2021 or early 2022. And you were able to sign up, pay your money and get on the waiting list. So you'd be the first ones to get the equipment. We said, wow, this is not that long to wait. It's only a year. We really need to get it because what happens if we have anything go wrong? We got to have protections for work. And so we paid the money and got on the waiting list. That was three, three and a half years ago. In the interim, so there's two things here, is what the internet's doing in Nicaragua and what Starlink's doing. In that time, Starlink went completely silent. They got our money and they never said another word to everyone who lives in Nicaragua. If you go and check their site now, it no longer says coming in 2022. It now doesn't say it's coming ever. They've completely abandoned Nicaragua, at least in their existing plans. That doesn't mean that they're blocking it and will never come here and aren't considering it. Of course, they probably are. They want to make money. That's how businesses work. But the idea that it is on their list of places that they're heading to in the foreseeable future, no, they have no plans. It is not on the schedule. They are not working towards it. So the hard line is right now at the moment, you cannot order, pre-order, buy, use anything Starlink in Nicaragua. It is not uh, viable in this jurisdiction. Starlink could allow you to use it here. In theory, they have satellites that cover this part of the world. That's only a theory. I don't know any place in this band that actually has service, but probably I believe they do. But they generally detect what country you're in, and if they don't have deals with that country, they block your access. So it isn't as portable as you would like to think it is. But that's okay, because we're going to talk about why you don't actually care but I want to break this down because Martin had questions. He said, you know, could I use it? The quick answer is no. But what if Starlink suddenly got approval? They decided Nicaragua is where they wanted to go. And even though it's not on the roadmap, they opened it up in the next six months. Would you then want to bring it with you? There's two challenges here. One is bringing it with you. The other is the service. So let's break these down. I'm trying to do the final edits for today's video, and as I'm doing it, it got posted on the show that uh, someone said that they know that Starlink, if you have an international plan and can somehow get the equipment into Nicaragua, both things are not the easiest things to do, then it should work here in Nicaragua. So that I had no idea about. So that's additional information that we just got. So I don't know if that's actually useful to anyone, but it's a little bit of clarity we didn't have. First, the problem of bringing it with you. So the Starlink equipment costs about $600, and this is well published. So if you were to arrive in Nicaragua with Starlink equipment, keep in mind, this is not tourist equipment. You cannot make a claim that you are simply on vacation and bringing your Starlink system with you. It is big. It is bulky. It requires to be mounted somewhere. It's, it's you know, like we bring a big video game gaming rig, not the, the you know, 3D headsets, no problem, not a... Uh, 
a Steam Deck or a Switch, no problem. Those are things people take with them on vacation. When you start bringing gear for your house, that is subject to import. It is not a tourist item and it is not expected to leave the country again, even if it could leave the country, even if you want it to leave the country, they're not gonna consider it that way. It is something that would be used as part of your house. So that is gonna be import. And it's a technology item. So there's both traditional import and technology taxes that have to be handled. So the, the normal import is the aduana or customs, and then the Department of Telecommunications has to oversee each device, make sure they know what it is. Um, and there's the taxes on that are not outrageous, but they do have to pay for the people to inspect everything. So there's taxes on that. So a $600 item like that coming in would be expected to have taxes of somewhere between three and $700. So every time you came and went, because bringing it back out of the country, you're not gonna get your money back. And if you bring it back in again in the future, they're not going to say, well, you've already brought it in. They're gonna say, oh, this is a new one coming in, right? And you'll probably be hit with those taxes again. So bringing it in and out is financially non-feasible right from the get-go. If you're doing this to save money, it will not be cheap because just because of those taxes, even if you only did it once every two years, that's a really high fee. To be paying considering just what the cost of internet is so that's the first problem uh the second problem uh beyond not having service so the third problem then is the performance so let's talk about that in 2015 when i first lived here the internet was definitely okay but not great it was better than spain better than italy nothing compared to a romania uh, or a ukraine more in line with a greece in the interim years, Nicaragua has put in a massive investment into their uh, network infrastructure, and they now are one of the best in the Western Hemisphere. On average, it is, in my experience, far better than the United States, and as what is available to real people, dramatically better. Not like close. We're talking way better. When I work with the U.S., I have hundreds, possibly thousands of clients across the United States. I deal with U.S. ISPs every day and the poor quality of support, the false information that comes from them, you know, they'll deny outages that they obviously caused, super low speeds, ancient infrastructure, people getting hooked up with DSL in the modern world, crazy things. All of those cause huge problems. Major metropolitan areas like Houston, Cincinnati, and San Francisco routinely are unable to get viable business internet because it's so slow and so unreliable. So the U.S. has problems. It also has markets that are absolutely fantastic, like Austin, where you have Google Fiber everywhere, and there's no way to compete in the market without providing something amazing. So they are just overloaded with some of the best choices in the world. But that's a huge disparity. The cities that are rich and good have unbelievably good internet and much of the population struggles to get access to anything i have lots of customers who have to use what you know cell towers to get their home internet because there's no infrastructure provided to their areas whatsoever and people use excuses like america's really rural and that does make it not incredibly uh profitable to supply internet to those really rural areas but there's supposed to be government programs that force these private companies to go there. But there's always a workaround, it seems. Here in Nicaragua, while there can be remote communities where you could fall off the grid, they are extremely few and far between. And areas that would be totally unserviced in America are serviced by fiber and high-speed multiple options here in Nicaragua. So in general, no matter where you are, the, the struggle in Nicaragua is the poverty limit. And so a lot of people don't have home internet simply because that's not a luxury they're going to spend money on. But is it available for them? If they had less money than you would need for internet in the U.S., could they have it? Yes, absolutely. So you, as someone moving here, have basically no worries as to where you would live uh, and whether or not you could afford excellent internet, right? You're never going to get as good as you have in Austin, Texas. It just is. But, but for an average in the U.S. or the risk that you're not going to have service, we don't have those problems. So if you're coming from someplace like Montana and you're like, oh, I, mean, I lived out on a ranch, there's no lines going out there. Here in Nicaragua, if you're in that same ranch in the middle of nowhere, they would definitely run fiber right to your house. No problem. So it's a completely different thing. And I know we've done this, right? We've been in real, really rural areas way out there. And they're like, oh yeah, fiber's right down the street. You're going to put up a house, Pff, fiber will be here in, you know, a week. And you're like, that's amazing and they're not like fifty thousand dollar build out they're like you know just sign up for our service completely different worlds so that first point is that the coverage here is excellent the second piece is that the speeds are very good we're on techo here i do all my uploading and everything through techo fiber we talked about this the other day it is 
excellent. It's the high quality business network here, but a lot of people should get it for home. If you're a digital nomad or really serious content creator, I recommend moving to Teco. It's worth the extra money. But if you're a normal person, whether you're even just a, a normal work from home digital nomad, or you're just someone who's going to, you know, play video games online, you're just going to watch a ton of Netflix, download a bunch of video games, whatever, then consumer networking is going to be better for you. That's Tigo and Claro. Most of the time, we have Kutel and a few other vendors as well. So you have some competition um, beyond the big three, but those are going to be the big names you're going to look at most of the time. And if you look at yesterday's episode, I talked about the cost and levels of Tigo service when you have it bundled with TV. Uh, and Claro is not going to be very far different. It's a couple dollars here and there, a couple little features here and there, but they stay pretty much in line because they're selling to the same audience. And so basically everywhere they go, people have Claro and Tigo as identical choices, more or less. And so they're trying to compete on which one has which television channel or who one or who is one dollar cheaper, things like that. So it's very, very close. I think Claro is typically just a tad cheaper, uh, but it's it's extremely close. Uh, so for most people, that's what's going to make sense. But you have these options, and those services are definitely going far beyond the speeds any person can reasonably use. Uh, and that's really important. In the United States, when we get really good internet, it also goes to speeds that are so ridiculously fast, there's nothing you can really use it for. There's, there's very little that you can actually do to leverage the speeds that they're getting you. Americans tend to be convinced that having massive amounts of speeds is somehow useful. And it is, over time, the, the amount you need for things is getting higher. But the rate at which they sell it and the rate at which we use it are very disparate. Most households struggle to ever really use more than 30 megabits per second sustained, and very few are going to bounce over about 50 to 70 megabits in bursts. That means like I'm just doing a big thing right now, I'm downloading something. And the reason for this is because the servers that you're pulling information from typically are shared by lots and lots of users and their bandwidth, while it may be huge, many times what you have at home it's shared between lots of people all at the same time, so your slice of it is unlikely to be anywhere close to what you're able to get in your home. And when it is, when it's on that rare occasion where you could have downloaded something faster, it's it's not something that matters for speed. It's not a situation where it's like, oh, my Netflix, I had to turn down the quality because it couldn't do it fast enough. It's not like um, I was making a phone call and it didn't sound good. It's like I'm downloading a video game and it takes an hour instead of 50 minutes. Do you notice that 10 minutes? Well, yeah, if you do that all the time, you would eventually notice. But in general, that's like, oh, I was doing something else while that downloaded. And when it finished downloading, I wasn't really paying close attention. It wasn't like I was sitting there staring at it 99% of the time. There are times when you're really excited about a game, you're gonna stare at it. But in general, you're not paying attention. And the chances are that you're not the bottleneck in those downloads, almost never. So it's it's important to, to understand that when we're talking speeds, all of these speeds are faster than any reasonable person needs and almost faster than any reasonable person actually wants if they knew what their use was. People tend to want really fast because they just don't know. And so it's like, well, faster must be better. Technically, I guess if it was free, the faster would be better. But if it's not free, is it worth $1? Not for me, not in most cases. I may do it anyway, because what's a dollar and I just want to be able to say I have the higher speed, I guess. But I mean, I'm talking about myself. Like I would actually be, okay, $1, I guess I would, even though I know, right, that I couldn't possibly use it. But here on the consumer networks like Tigo, they're offering just on their website, 500 megabits per second, which is way beyond, right? We, we tell people, you know, Getting up to like 100, 120, yes, if it's a good price, that makes sense. Even 200, that's a good price point. Going much beyond that becomes really unusable in most cases. So we have bandwidth speeds here that are absolutely adequate for any use case. We have symmetrical services like Teco, that's where the upload and the download are the same. And we have asymmetrical like Tigo and Claro, which are generally considered consumer services, where your download is greater than your upload. The number of times you need your upload to be as good as your download is very few. Most uh, digital nomads do not need that at all. It is content creators who really struggle with that because we actually upload more than we download in many cases. I certainly do. So that's where I have to pay for that. That's what matters. Um, but the amount you normally need is, is relatively small. You can manage that. And people who are doing that kind of upload are aware of how it's being used. So unlike 2015, when I was here before, Nicaragua has really good coverage of internet, has really good competition in internet, and now it has internet speeds that are rivaling or surpassing uh, what your 
able to get in much of the United States. The average that people do pay for in the United States is still faster. So if you look at averages, what the average services in the United States looks pretty fast, but that's because they're including people who are spending uh, lots of money to get things like in Austin, and someone mentioned this on my channel, they get two gigabits per second. So if you get a group of people who get two gigabits per second, that will offset people who don't get any internet at all by quite a bit. It's not a meaningful number to take as an average. It doesn't actually tell you anything. So you could have a country like the United States and have only 1% of the population even have access to internet. Give those people unlimited speeds that you couldn't even imagine using. Like you could give them 100 gigabit speeds in that 1% of the population, and 99% of your popu population may have no internet whatsoever, and those people who have 100 uh, gigabits per second, they can never use more than, like I said, 50, maybe 100 megabits, a tiny 0.1% of what you're selling them. So the actual amount of usage doesn't change. So if you can imagine if you're a country or a, a company that's providing internet access, I only have to find one customer to whom I can make a connection that I know they won't abuse. They won't find a way to use it and sell them any ludicrous number I want and use that to change the average number. And that's not an intentional thing, I don't think, that's happening. But when you're looking at average numbers, that's what you're seeing happen. You're not seeing, are people able to, on average, get good speeds downloading things? They're saying, if, the, if in theoretical, the people who had really big pipes were averaged with people who have no pipes, what is the average speed? How do you average zero into that? Like, it's very complicated. And how do you average something you can't use? It would be very similar to... If you had, uh, if you want to know the average speed of highways in a country, and let's say you just had two highways, one went 3,000 miles, it went from New York to LA, it's the first highway in the United States, it's one lane wide, each car going one direction has to cause another car wait for another direction, so you can only get one car in one direction every 72 hours, and that's if they don't sleep. Okay, so now you have the slowest highway in the world, it's the most ridiculous, useless thing, but you want the country to look like it's really, really good compared to other countries. Well, then you make another highway that only goes between your house and the neighbor's house, but you put in a hundred lanes wide on it. And when people say, what's the average speed to go from one destination to its other destination on highways in the United States and how many cars can go at once, you say, ah, we have a hundred lanes on this one. So it's 50 in one direction, 50 in the other direction. And we can move all of them from end to end in under 10 seconds. And you average that against the other highway that's totally useless that goes all the way across the country and moves one car every 72 hours. And suddenly your average is the best highway system in the world and none of it is useful. And so it's one of those situations where taking a mean average means, no pun intended, absolutely nothing. What matters is how fast is the usable. It's a much more uh, uh, interpretive uh, statistic. Uh, but here in Nicaragua, we certainly have a greater incidence of availability of usefully fast, reliable internet compared to the United States, which has huge gaps and spikes of incredibly good, but generally unused internet. And of course, when it's unused, it costs the internet providers nothing. So they're able to keep providing more and more theoretical high speed without it actually being used so that it looks better and better, even though for them, the amount of speed that a household uses under normal circumstances doesn't really change. When you go from 10 megabits to 30, yes, people suddenly start streaming higher quality. They download more things because they can. They're not saturated all the time. But when you move from 30 to a gig, people don't significantly change. They don't turn on extra TVs in the house to stream Netflix for no reason. They don't uh, download things that they don't need most of the time, right? They're, because where are they going to store it? What are they going to do with it? Why would they spend their time doing that? They just enjoy that they never have to worry about running out of bandwidth. That's So your behavior doesn't necessarily change just because you have a bigger pipe. It's kind of like one household doesn't get any water and another one can get m enough to flood the house in a matter of minutes. Well, it doesn't really matter. You only can use maybe two or three times what a garden hose can deliver at full full throttle at any given moment. You want multiple people to be able to take showers. You want to be able to wash dishes while people are in the shower, flush toilets and refill quickly. Yes, you can use more than a single faucet can deliver, but you can't use as much as Niagara Falls pouring into your house. But if someone provided that to you as a water provider, that would be silly. But if they use it as an average to compare against all the people who didn't have water supply, it would feel very misleading.
All right, moving on. The other major aspects of internet provisioning that really matter to us, one is reliability. And this is difficult to gauge. Definitely in large parts of the United States, like where I've lived, like in Dallas, Texas, reliability is excellent. The number of times we had outages on our internet approached zero. I'm not actually sure in 11 years of living in Dallas, Texas, if we ever had more than maybe five minutes of cumulative outage. That was incredibly good. Here in Nicaragua, we're seeing not quite that good, but not bad at all far better than most of our customers in the United States. I would say that in general, the averages are pretty close. So neither is perfectly reliable. Neither of them approaches Romania uh, for reliability. None of them approach Japan. But as far as uh, general internet reliability, if you're on a good provider, um, both are pretty good. Here, if you're on like Teco, the reliability is extremely good. If you're on Claro and Tigo, it definitely goes down a bit. You're paying a lot less for those services, uh, but it's still quite good. Getting someone out to service your internet or deal with outages is very good here. Like it's much easier and they respond very quickly. Uh, so that's, I, I would say that I feel like it's better overall here, but it's very much an emotional feeling. So I can't actually say that that's true. I can say that you do not have a problem with reliability here. If you're okay with what you have in the United States, uh, as far as general reliability, you are definitely okay here. They're in line. It's not like Spain and Italy where we had just outages nonstop and no one knew how to fix it. And the gear was terrible and it, you were just, it was what it was. Here they can actually deal with things and they do. So that's important. The other thing that really matters is latency. And people assume that because we're a different country that latency to major services is going to be quite high. This is really critical because when we're looking at the latency numbers here and compare them to a really high quality service, a Google, a uh, Fios, uh, services like that in the United States, yes, those services have incredible latency numbers. And for those who are not aware, latency should be small, not big. This is the delay number, how much you wait for packets to go from your home to wherever it needs to go and return. And of course, it varies by who you're going to, but there's standard services for measuring this. If you're measuring those services in the United States, you're often getting numbers like two milliseconds. That's roughly as good as you can possibly get, and they're amazing. So those are available. And when you have services like that in the United States, you feel how fast they are. That people is what people will actually perceive as speed and uh, not exactly reliability, but when they want a stable, really fast internet service, it is that latency with no packet drops that actually gives that sense of, of being really fast, not the download and upload speeds. Those things get saturated only when you overrun them. Until they're overrun, they don't affect you at all, but latency affects you in every little thing. So that's wonderful. If you can get a service like that, you will feel the difference. But if you're on cable or especially DSL, those numbers are going to be wildly higher. Instead of two milliseconds, you could be looking at something from about 18 milliseconds on the on the good end to easily hundreds of milliseconds on the bad end. So uh, that's kind of the range. When you're looking at Starlink in the United States, they get a huge range, but the average is in the 50 to 70 millisecond range, which is absolutely fine. That works completely good. You won't have any problems with that, but that is not a wonderful number. That is not something that you strive for. It's something that, well, you're okay with. And in normal circumstances, that is completely good. Here in Nicaragua, we're actually getting just slightly faster, low 50s, very reliably. It's possible to hit the high 40s. That's you're going to get really lucky. If you're in Managua, you can probably get in the 40s. We're talking out here in outlying areas. I'm I'm hours from Managua. Every bit of internet outside of the main pipe coming in at Puerto Cabeza goes through Managua. So if you're in Managua, you're going to get your best services. But even out here in Leon or like in San Juan del Sur, someplace like that, you're going to be looking at about 48 as the absolute best number to about 55 as kind of an average and any given service could bump higher you could have problems with the pipe and it'll go higher but those are the numbers we're getting and so that means importantly one that the internet here is absolutely adequate and is going to behave better than the standard american services in many cases but the thing we care about is starlink and it means that we are generally even though we're in a different country performing better here our internet here is faster then Starlink in a latency performance, than Starlink in the United States. If you were to move uh, your Starlink equipment to Nicaragua, we would expect it to get a little bit slower because in latency, because it has to do extra hops even in the satellite system. It's not gonna be dramatic. One of the, system, the nice things about that system is that those moves between countries don't create dramatic extra latency, but the system creates latency on its own. And so it already has that built-in latency. And so it, it needs to overcome that in order to compete with, with what we call terrestrial fiber. And with the terrestrial fiber here in Nicaragua, we have 
better latency than Starlink in the United States. So dropping Starlink in the US, moving to Nicaragua and getting Teco here, even in a rural area, is going to outperform Starlink in that way. So those are all the factors that we're dealing with. So let's put it together with Starlink. Assuming Starlink became available, which again, there are no plans. It is not on the roadmap. They've completely abandoned Nicaragua. If they were to change their minds and come to Nicaragua, you would be facing these problems. One, every time you bring the equipment in, you would probably pay for all the equipment at least 50%, if not 100% or more again. So that would be absolutely overly costly and cumbersome to bring the equipment in and out. Assuming you brought it in one time and left it, however, or somehow managed to purchase it here and have it shipped here directly, like we were supposed to have originally happen, you still have the problem that the monthly service costs significantly more than similar services here terrestrial. So you're not going to save money month to month. You're going to pay a premium. You would need the service to be quite a bit better to justify paying the premium. Now, the premium's not that huge. Starlink is about $120 per month, and the services you're going to get here, uh, if you're looking at um, uh, content creator services like, like my system, I get uh, two to three times the bandwidth of, of uh, Starlink for upload. They get 10 to 20. Most of the time, you can sometimes hit 50, but that's, a, that's an upward limit. I have 50 all the time rock solid, and if I needed more, I can easily buy it. I'm at only $80, $85 uh, per month, so I'm at roughly two-thirds the price of Starlink but I'm getting uh, three to five times the average performance on the numbers that matter uh, with slightly better latency. But that, that's really uh, a break even for all intents and purposes. But on my upload, I'm getting so much more than Starlink would deliver me on average. I might, might have one day where it's really good on Starlink and they'd be about equal. They would never match it. It would never be better. It would always be a bit less, just sometimes just a little bit less, but most of the time, a significant amount less that would be enough that I may not be able to do what I do on Starlink at any price. You can't, I don't think you can upgrade uh, the up speed, only the down speed. And uh, even that, I'm not sure if you have many choices. So you're already, if you're in this world, Starlink's out of the question. It doesn't do the job even in the US. Like just, it just doesn't. So that's significant that we get more reliable service, better latency, two thirds the price, and three to four times the performance. There's no reason to bring Starlink if that's the world you're in. Now, what if you're in a normal end user world, which is what Starlink is designed for? Starlink is an asymmetrical consumer service, not a business service. So it's not like Teco, but Teco, if you're gonna do business, you're allowed to use Starlink and Teco just blows it out of the water here in Nicaragua. If you're looking at consumer services, the Claros, the Tigos, the ones that come with television bundled in, sometimes you don't have to, but it generally does. Sometimes it's cheaper when you do. Uh, those are going to be, if you're looking at speeds similar to uh, Starlink with much more similar latency, like all the numbers are very close, they're the same style service, then with all the Nicaraguan TV, with all the extended features, with the um, uh, terrestrial connections that are not affected by the weather, uh, with the uh, lack of having to purchase upfront equipment, you're looking at about $45 a month to get equal to almost double, depending, but at 45 on Tigo from yesterday's, I believe you match Starlink in speed, and if, uh, in most of the time, and if you go up to the uh, $48 plan, you nearly always beat it, and by the time you go to the $95 plan, you're like uh, starting to push double all but the, the fastest ever outlying tests of, of Starlink, um, and so, at, at no matter what you're going to spend, no matter what price point you're at, you are saving money versus Starlink on those services, plus getting extra stuff with it uh, and getting more speed. But in practical terms, the Starlink is only practically delivering you between one and 200 megabits. Anything else is just an outlying lucky day. Uh, and you can do, this is over thousands of tests, like they know how the, the distribution works. Um, for those, you're looking at about 45 to maybe $48 to meet or beat realistic Starlink uh, experience on, on a consumer level. And that means it's a little bit over one third, but dramatically under one half the monthly price of Starlink without all the hassles. So those numbers really add up to, this is how much uh, the situation has changed. If it was 2015, and we had Starlink now, 
Starlink would blow away what we had in 2015, but Nicaragua has advanced so quickly. Even in the since when we came back in 2021, they had already put in most of this, but the costs continue to go down and the service speed and reliability continue to go up. So we're moving from an already good position in 2021 to an absolutely amazing one in 2024 and continuing on into the future. Like this seems to be unabated. It just keeps improving. Whereas Starlink, while it does improve, is not in any way at the same pace. So where, where Starlink would have been a knock it out of the ballpark choice in 2015, by 2021, it was a foolish choice on our side to have considered getting it. We just didn't realize that Nicaragua had come so far and that we had absolutely no worries like we thought we did. We really thought we were going to be living in a rural area and that we were going to be desperately seeking internet. And we had no idea that we were going to walk into better fiber than we had in the United States, multiple carrier options, customer support that just in a moment's notice come running out to help us. It is so much better, so much cheaper. It's just been a huge win. And then when we bought land in the middle of quite literally uh, what's effectively virgin jungle. No one has been there in hundreds of years. It is so far from anything, totally remote. And we talked to the fiber carrier and they're like, yeah, yeah, as soon as you got posts to put stuff on, just let us know. We'll have fiber there in a couple of days. And you're like, Wh what? Okay, there's no need for Starlink anywhere. We were so sure we were going to need it at least as a backup. And within our first few months, we were like, what were we thinking? This makes no sense. Um, and now we've canceled it. And now they've canceled coming to the country, probably for these reasons. Anyone who looked at Starlink and looked at the numbers here, once you got here, would instantly be like, oh, gosh, that makes no sense at all. So it's important to have those numbers for Martin because, like, you know, it seems like, well, if I have this in the U.S., and just bringing it down has got to be, you know, bad. it's like single service. There's all these, like, it seems good. It is so much hassle. It is so much cost and it is so much lower quality uh, that it just, it just doesn't make sense. If you're in the rural United States, I have lots of customers that we push to Starlink all the time because the terrestrial terrestrial carriers in the United States are so bad that Starlink's whole model is satellite internet isn't a great idea in general, right? It is to replace uh, really bad terrestrial. And in lots of the world, like Eastern Europe and, and Nicaragua as examples, when you have good terrestrial, there is no market for satellite whatsoever. But when you're in places like the United States where there's no government pressure and oversight or no good government oversight on the carriers to make sure that they're rolling out to rural areas, to make sure that they're delivering what they say, they're able to put in monopolies and there's nothing people can do about it. Here in Nicaragua, there is no monopoly. It's an open capitalist market. It's not like the United States. So because of that, there's competition and these companies have to provide a good job. If Claro doesn't do a good job, everyone will move to Tigo or vice versa. If both of them suck, they're just gonna move to Teco. People will pay the premium because they have to, right? And they'll they'll shift around as needed. So they keep each other in check, which is completely lacking in the US and Canadian markets. And it shows in how much it costs, how poor the service is, how unreliable, and how much people are scared and, and have to get things like satellite to uh, in, enable a protection against extortion. Because every one of my customers who doesn't have, you know, the luxury of being in like an Austin is in a market. They're like, we, we can't even make our ISP mad. What if they cancel our service? There's nothing we can do. We have no alternatives. And it's amazing that in a market so big and rich that there is no alternatives. There's no way to keep the companies on their toes, to keep the prices down, to keep uh, competition so that performance keeps moving forward. But there just isn't. Once people buy rights uh, to your home, they own your home for all intents and purposes. So you a major thing in the US. Uh, as a business person, the first thing you look at when in, look, putting in a business, not a restaurant, but any kind of office is you have to look at the internet first. You base your decisions on what, where you're going to put an office, on which internet providers are available for that specific building. If, they're, if you don't have competition and they're not good providers, you have to look somewhere else. It will completely cripple your business. It's such a huge factor. Other parts of the world, you don't have to do that. Here in Nicaragua, it doesn't matter where you're going to put an office building. You have lots of competition and basically the same competition. So as long as someone is able to provide what you want, you can get that essentially anywhere. There's exceptions, right? Teco does not cover as much of the country as Claro and Tigo, for example. There are some really rural areas that are missing some services. But in general, you have incredible coverage everywhere and you just don't have these worries. And anyone can go into any building. It's not like um, that uh, you get monopolies by neighborhood and by building in the U.S. It's, it's absolutely crazy. So that stuff is really important. The, the mindset needs to change. So we don't have the risks that the U.S. has, and we don't have the risks that Nicaragua used to have. And it's not perfect by any stretch, and it's certainly not as good as Romania. There's lots of countries that are still ahead of Nicaragua, but here in the region, Nicaragua is leading by a lot. And when you're comparing to Starlink, Starlink just does not fill a niche that is needed here, and it doesn't have a performance or price point that makes sense unless you're working around the U.S. market problems. It's specific 
specifically in the U.S. and Canada, there are things that Starlink is needed for to fill gaps in the provisioning market or to provide competition where it doesn't otherwise exist. Down here, you've got everything you need. Just use one of our national carriers. You will be very happy with what you're able to get at a good price point. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, like, share, post on social media, watch another video, and I will see all of you tomorrow.